If you need to take a moment to pause the video and reread the problem, go ahead and do so now. In order for us to calculate the electric field to the left and to the right and in between these sheets of charge, we have to first understand how to calculate the electric field produced by a sheet of charge. And to do that, we have to apply Gauss's law. So here is a representation of a positive sheet of charge. The analysis would be very similar for a negative sheet of charge. Now, Gauss's law tells us to first draw a Gaussian surface. We've drawn a cylindrical Gaussian surface that sort of penetrates right through this sheet of positive charge. And here is another view of our Gaussian surface sort of penetrating through that positive sheet of charge. Now, this sheet of charge is positive, which means the electric field vectors are going to be pointing away from the sheet. So on the left side, you can see electric field vectors pointing to the left away from the sheet. And on the right side, you can see electric field vectors pointing to the right away from the sheet again. Now, mathematically, Gauss's law tells us to take the total electric flux that's sort of penetrating our Gaussian surface and then set that equal to the total amount of charge enclosed by our Gaussian surface divided by a physical constant. We need to talk about the left side of this integral first. That's the total electric flux that's penetrating our Gaussian surface. Now you might notice that the electric field lines, those blue lines, are only penetrating the right end cap as well as the left end cap. None of the field lines are actually sort of penetrating the side. So there's no electric field vector pointing up and there's no electric field vector pointing down. And thus we only need to consider the electric flux through the left end cap and through the right end cap. So just keep that in mind. We can rewrite our integral here by recalling that a dot product is the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of the so-called dA vector, which we'll talk about momentarily, and then multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. Now, as far as the dA vector is concerned, what we do is we go to where the electric field is piercing our Gaussian surface, and we imagine a vector pointing away from the interior of our Gaussian surface. So it's very important to always point your dA vectors away from the interior of the Gaussian surface. And you can see on the right end cap that the dA vector and the electric field vector are pointing in the same direction. They're both pointing to the right. So the angle between them would be zero. If you look at the left end cap, it's the same idea. You would draw your dA vector pointing away from the interior of your Gaussian surface. And again, the dA vector and the electric field vector are both pointing in the same direction. So the angle over there is also zero degrees. The cosine of zero degrees, of course, is one. So we can actually remove this term from our calculation. Now, the electric field itself is going to be a constant value everywhere on each end cap. So for example, this little electric field vector pointing to the right is going to have the same magnitude as the electric field vector that would be drawn here. The reason for that is, of course, because this point on the Gaussian surface and this point on the Gaussian surface are both located the same distance from that sheet of charge. And this sheet of charge is uniformly distributed in its charge. So the electric field on every point of our end cap is going to have a constant value. Same thing on the left end cap as well. The electric field is going to have a constant magnitude. Therefore, because the electric field has a constant magnitude, we can actually factor it out. So we're going to go ahead and do that right now. As far as this integral of dA, we can consider the right end cap. And on the right end cap, as well as the left, we would have these little so-called patch elements. So the book talks about imagining little square areas that are kind of dispersed throughout our little Gaussian surface here. And what we need to do is find the total area of those little patch elements. So every single one of those patch elements is a dA. It's a very teeny tiny area. But if you were to add all the areas of all of those patch elements, then you would simply get the area of the right end cap. So all of those areas, all those dA areas added together would just give you the area of that right end cap. Same with the area of the left end cap. Remember, we have flux penetrating that end cap as well. So the area over on the left end cap is also A. So what this means is that the integral of dA is the total area of the surface that's being sort of penetrated by our electric fields. So that total area is gonna be the area of the right end cap plus the area of the left end cap. And now we get to the enclosed charge. How much charge is actually enclosed by our Gaussian surface? And if we kind of zoom back in on our picture here, you can see that the charge within the Gaussian surface would be located right there. So we can actually draw in some positive charges right there. That's sort of where the sheet intersects the Gaussian cylinder. 
that's where the charge resides within the Gaussian cylinder. So how do we figure out that amount of charge on that little Gaussian sort of surface there? Well, we know that the total amount of charge present or distributed across that area would be the surface charge density multiplied by the area. Surface charge density is measured in coulombs per meter squared. Area, of course, is measured in meters squared. When you multiply those dimensionally, you do get coulombs. So to find the amount of charge dispersed on this little area right here, we simply take the surface charge density and we multiply it by the area there. Now that area is still A. It's the same area as the right end cap and the left end cap. So we go back to Q enclosed and we're going to replace that with the surface charge density multiplied by the area. Now in the brackets on the left hand side there, you're going to have two A. And if we look carefully, the A's on the left and right hand sides would actually neatly cancel out. And then if we divide both sides by two, we get the following expression for the electric field produced by the sheet of positive charge. That's the expression that we're going to be using for a positive sheet. And we can also use that same expression for a negative sheet. We'll just have to be careful about the direction that we point our electric field vector. So let's keep that expression in mind and let's now go to the picture and start calculating the total electric fields. Now in part A of the question we are asked to calculate the electric field at a point to the left of the negative sheet of charge. Now consider that negative sheet of charge. You probably know that negative charges create electric fields and those electric fields point towards the negative. So we would actually have an electric field vector pointing towards the negative sheet of charge. We would call that E negative. Next, we consider the positive sheet of charge. Now, positive charges produce electric fields that point away from the positive. So the positive sheet of charge would create an electric field pointing away from the positive sheet, so it would point to the left. Those two vectors are actually going to cancel each other out. Remember, the electric field only depends on the surface charge density, which is the same value for both the negative and the positive sheet. And so these two vectors will cancel out, and therefore the net electric field to the left of the negative sheet of charge is going to be zero newtons per coulomb. In unit vector notation, we might throw an i hat on there. We say i hat because that indicates the x direction and that's the direction that these vectors are pointing. For part b, it's gonna be a very similar story. Now we're on the right side of the sheets of charge. Now again, the negative sheet of charge creates an electric field pointing towards the negative. The positive sheet creates an electric field away from the positive. Those are pointing in opposite directions. So the net electric field one more time is going to be zero newtons per coulomb. And if you need the unit vector notation, you can say I hat. Now we go to the middle, part C, and that's where things get interesting because in the middle, we have the electric field from the negative pointing to the left. That would be our E negative. And then we have the electric field from the positive also pointing to the left because again, we have to point away from positive. So that would be the direction of E positive. And therefore, those two vectors can be added together because they're pointing in the same direction. So for part C, we're going to say that the total electric field is going to be the E positive plus the E negative. Now, technically to the left would be in the negative X direction. So we might actually wanna modify that by sticking a negative sign in front of this sum. And that way we can get the correct direction. Now we fill in the expressions. Remember from our earlier discussion, the electric field produced by the positive is going to be the epsilon, uh, excuse me, sigma over two epsilon. And then same thing with the negative, it's sigma over two epsilon. We can combine those because you're gonna get two sigma over two epsilon, those twos would cancel. So you would just be left with sigma over epsilon. The question gives us the value of sigma, which is that surface charge density, and then we know the value of epsilon as well. And when you punch that into your calculator, you should get the electric field is equal to negative 7.91 times 10 to the minus 11. We have the standard unit of electric field as newtons per coulomb. And again, in unit vector notation, Everything is directed along a horizontal axis, also known as the x direction, so you could put an i hat on there. That is the correct answer to part C.